recording in progress. Great. So, yes, yeah, so I'm just going to start off with a quick introduction to UCL. Um, we're going to meet some of the people we're talking to today. I will then go through, explain some of the more detailed aspects of studying by distance learning. And then, um, and then you should have a good idea, hopefully, of whether you'd like to apply it or not. Um, so uh, UCL Engineering's motto, to change the world, you need to be taught differently. And that's certainly true of our distance learning program, a different way of studying for many people, but certainly an effective one we found over the years. So as I said, we're gonna be talking today about the physics and engineering and medicine MSc by distance learning, um, with uh, mostly with two of us today, uh, but we're gonna have a couple of extra guests later who will join as well. So I'm Billy Dennis, I'm uh, the distance learning tutor for the Department of uh, Physics, uh, Medical Physics and Biomedical Engineering. And I'm also the Postgraduate Taught Programs Deputy Program, Program Director. So I can also answer quite a lot of questions if you've got uh, queries about other courses that we do in our department that are not distance learning. You'll find me lecturing on modules, etc. as well. Also with us today, we've got the um, Postgraduate Taught Program Director, which is Professor Ilias Taxidis. So hi, Ilias, if you'd like yeah, to say hello. Hi, Billy. Uh, great to be here. Uh, welcome everyone to our physics engineering in medicine by distance learning open day. So I'm quite excited, you know, to welcome you uh, to this open day, and hopefully we can welcome you to UCL and uh, the Department of Medical Physics and Biomedical Engineering. Billy, can you show the next slide? Um, I would like here perhaps to emphasize a couple of things about our department. We are part of the Faculty of Engineering, and we are very strong in clinical and healthcare related research. We produce world leading and international excellent research. And this is mainly to the fact that we actually develop and apply here the best of sort of engineering techniques and technologies. And we are surrounded by uh, university colleges and hospitals and institutes that allow us not only to develop these technologies and these techniques, but to explore you know, how these are, you know, can be used uh, to help patients in the hospital. And in fact, the key thing on this is uh, the projects that some of our students are doing uh, with our hospital partners. We are a small department. We have about 40 permanent academic staff, 12 research and teaching fellows. Uh, we've got quite a lot of, as you can see, postdoctoral research staff. And we are very proud to, to be very sort of said research focus and you can see this from our uh, PhD student numbers got 170 PhD student numbers and indeed some of our PhD students are coming from uh, attending our master's uh, programs and then sort of wanted to follow our kind of an academic route and we're very proud you know to have our students uh, join the department and helping us with our research. Um, the next slide so I want here perhaps to say a couple of things about the research. And first of all, just to let you know that we have a quite a nice website that describes our, of course, our teaching activities, but also our research activities. And I would definitely, definitely recommend that you spend some time to explore our research websites and to explore some of our research activities. Basically, what is happening is that we, our research is kind of like split in different labs and groups. We have a group that, uh, and a lab that works very, uh, you know, quite significantly in medical imaging using different types of technologies. It can be uh, MRI, it can be ultrasound, biomedical optics. A lot of my work, for example, is related to biomedical optics. And there is a research lab that is called Biomedical Optics Research Laboratory. And in there, you'll find all the different groups that do photonics developments as well. We have people that work in researchers here, professors work on radiation physics, looking at advanced X-ray methodologies, uh, proton therapy, X-ray diffraction. And again, we you know, we work very close with the hospitals and we just recently launched the new uh, proton therapy uh, institute, uh, uh, which is just down the road. And we actually working very close with them. We have people that are doing, you know, more kind of electronic uh, engineering work, like looking at implanted devices, like neuromodulation, we have a lot of collaboration with neuroscience um, and looking at neuro and neurophysics, but also doing, as I said, neuroimaging. And very recently also, we launched a new institute uh, of robotics and artificial intelligence and work very closely with artificial intelligence applications in healthcare, quite a computing type of engineering there. And also, you know, looking at surgical robotics. So I'm just gonna stop here and again, uh, invite you, all of you guys, 
go and explore our website and have a look at our research activities. I think it will make a huge difference uh, uh, for you to understand what exactly we can do in this department and why you should actually come and join our department. Uh, so Billy, I'm gonna now hand it over to you. And um, you know, uh, and again, if any other questions or something, you can always connect with me and I'm quite happy you know, to, uh, to support and help you answer those questions. Thanks, Billy. Great, thank you very much, uh, Elias. Um, uh, so, I'm, yeah, I'm going to go through and talk about the distance learning route of the MSc on the whole. And I thought I'd just start with a quick history of where this course comes from. Um, it was founded originally by Professor Joseph Rotblatt, who was a Nobel Pri Prize winner, although not in physics, actually, in the end. He was a physicist, but he actually got the Nobel Prize for peace uh, as part of the nuclear disarmament movement that he was a, as a leading figure on. Anyway, when he originally left the atomic bomb research development uh, at the end of the Second World War, he um, moved to London and set up a radiation physics master's course to find more humane uses of uh, radiation physics. And that's the origins of our course. We, we sh our heritage comes from that. Over the years, of course, the modules have changed, the lecturers almost certainly have all changed. Yeah, I think we've got one lecturer who still lectured with us in the 80s. But, um, but yeah, of course, there have been updates over the years, but that's the basis of our, of our MSc. And then in 2011, the distance learning route was open to uh, replicate that uh, successful long running MSc program, but to do it online. Um, it's the exact same course. And the idea is that you take the exact same assessments and you get the exact same qualification as, as if you were studying in person in London. You get all the same experiences. You still get to do research with our excellent research groups, but you're just doing it from a place which may not uh, be here on campus. And so uh, our first graduates were in 2013, um, which probably shows to you that a lot of our students, particularly at the start of the course, were part-time studying students. Normally the MSc takes one year to complete here on campus, but you can study part-time or flexibly and take more years. And we're gonna talk a bit about that later. But over the years, actually, we've had more students uh, taking the distance learning routes uh, full-time as well, but that, our first graduates in 2013. And then in 2015, the course, including the on-campus version and the distance learning was accredited by IPEM. Um, and it's the only distance learning MSc course in our subject area to be uh, to be accredited by IPEM. There's a couple of uh, significant pieces of significance about that. The first is that it shows the mark of the quality of the course, that we've got a very high quality course um, and uh, is, is, is leading in our nation. But the second part is that that accreditation means that for those of you who are looking for future careers, perhaps in the NHS as clinical scientists, you can use your MSc training here as part of that uh, accreditation that you'll need. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very useful accreditation for you, potentially as students. And I will just say finally, it's been a very successful course over the years. Um, we won personal tutoring awards in, uh, at UCL in 2018 and 2019. Um, and I think the, the reason for that largely is because we do insist on giving a lot of personal attention to our distance learning students, recognizing that, uh, that it's a different way of studying and sometimes that personal attention is really needed. And so we're very proud of that and uh, we continue to provide excellent uh, personal support to our students. So, as I said before, the, the, this, the distance learning route of the MSc is in the radiation physics stream. Uh, on campus, you might know there's a computing stream and there's a engineering stream as well that they have a slightly different focus. Um, but this is in the radiation physics stream. Um, and time to complete the distance learning course, you've got three main options that you can do. One is just do the MSc in a single year, which would be considered full-time, um, which you would, if you'd started the degree in September this coming year, you'd finish by August, 2023. Um, there's something called part-time, which specifically under UCL's terminology means that it's a two-year MSc. So you take half the MSc modules in the first year, half in the second year, and you complete over two years. But there's a third option, which is actually quite common on our distance learning students, which is up to a maximum of five years called flexible study. Now you can actually choose within flexible study exactly how many years you'd like to complete the MSc over. But the idea is that if, you, um, if there are life circumstances that mean that you might not be able to study full-time or even part-time, or if you need to change your plans, 
then you can do that and you can take up to a maximum of five years. Most students don't take five years on that route. They actually take usually two or three years. Um, but those extra years are available if something happens that means you need a bit more time. So in the past, we might have had a student who's maybe had some military service or had parenting responsibilities, and that meant that they had to slow down the rate at which they studied. So they took an extra year, for example, to complete the MSc. Um, the distance learning gives you the option completely, if you would like, to study completely alone. You don't need necessarily to interact with other students apart from in one module, which is a group project module. So it allows you to focus completely on your own work, which is quite nice. But what's more recommended probably is that you join up with your cohorts that are studying with you uh, to do some group work, to do exercise together, to develop your understanding together, because I actually feel that's the by far better way of learning. Um, and then finally, you do have opportunities, even if you are registered as a distance learning student, you may come and visit campus whenever you like. It's not expected and it's certainly not required. But if you are interested in coming for a visit for London, to London, you might come for a two week period or something like that uh, to come to lectures, to visit your research supervisors. And we do have students as well who uh, come and attend uh, some work experience with with our some of our clinical lectures perhaps in the institute of nuclear health perhaps at uclh in the radiotherapy department or the proton therapy department that's all possible to you you're still a normal student like any other msc student and you still get those same opportunities as if you were studying here in london but uh but you just need to book them in basically so here on the right you can see an example of some of our students joining in a group session with uh in the lecture theater uh, and we've got a couple of distance learning students studying online at the same time so what kind of profile might you be in order to study uh, with us? Well, I would say these three are probably amongst the most common and in various combinations. So um, we might have a student's background being in physics. We might have students background being in engineering and in different forms of engineering often. Or we might have a student's background being in computer science. Um, those are probably the three most common. Amongst the, uh, the reasons to study, we might have people who are working full time in, hosp in a hospital such as Charlotte here, and they require MSc for the, um, for the academic component of their clinical scientist registration in the NHS. And they will come to us and they'll study usually part time, perhaps over two years whilst working full time in their job. Um, in that case, perhaps their work, the hospital might give them half a day off a week to study or might give them a full day off a week to study. That would be very common. A second option might be something like if you're working full time, but not in a related hospital or in a, in a related area, but you're looking to change into our subject area, into, into medical physics and biomedical engineering. Um, and so perhaps you have a little bit less available study time per week. And so you might consider instead of studying the MSc over two years, taking a little bit more time and studying over three years at a slightly slower rate. Um, that might be for Wei Ren here, for example. And the final example, which is becoming more and more common over the last few years, is just to study full time. Someone looking for an option to study, but can't come to London for whatever reason, or uh, is their personal situations mean that they would actually be better off studying by distance learning. And I, as the distance learning tutor, can recommend this route actually as well. We do have a lot of students studying this way, probably for the first time. They've not studied by distance learning in their in their career previously at schools and in their undergraduate is not very common but it might i can actually recommend there's lots of good reasons why distance learning is in fact slightly better um, depending on your particular lifestyle so those are the three main sort of profiles that you might be thinking about and that if you do it that way you'd have all the same opportunities as these first two perhaps you want to go and work at hospitals later but it might be that you're interested in following a career in research afterwards as well and might join our, one of our department's research groups as a phd etc but again these are all very flexible but these are just some examples that you might uh you might be interested in so flexible study, we mentioned that already, and uh, that is the real strength of the program, I would say, overall, no matter which of the routes you take, part-time, flexible or full-time. The idea is that it's fully adaptable to suit your personal situation. Now, for some people, that might mean that you're working in jobs full-time or part-time. And so the flexibility of the program means that you can study it even whilst doing those jobs and you don't have to attend lectures live and you can still complete the MSc and study well. It's also flexible in terms of 
a, a day-to-day -day basis. You can, if you have a busy work day, for example, when you need to catch up, it doesn't matter if you've missed out studying that particular day, you can catch up. It's flexible in a way that on-campus teaching is not quite so flexible. Um, so what we do ask for all our students, and this is probably more recommended for the part-time students, is that we ask you to enroll on your modules in September that year and you commit to those modules for that academic year based on your available study time. That usually starts with a conversation with me at the start of the year to say, how much study time do you think you've got? And I can make a recommendation to you. Um, but the thing is, when you commit to study like maybe three modules in, in your first year, you aren't committed to anything in future. So you can decide exactly next year whether your circumstances have changed and you might want to finish the whole MSc that next year. Maybe you've got less time available and you need to only study one module or have a full year out. That's the purpose of the flexibility of the course. You can completely change and you're not committed to anything other than the modules you registered on uh, in this particular year. So as I said before, years four and five are generally backup years, but, but they can be used and uh, occasionally are. And the final thing to say about the flexibility of the program is that the study is asynchronous, meaning that you do not have to attend any timetabled lectures during the week. So if you come and study here on campus, you might have your MRI lectures on Monday morning from 10 o'clock until 12 o'clock. That is not something that you have to clock yourself in for with our program. It's asynchronous, meaning all those lectures and all those study resources are available to you from the very start of the year. Um, and again, that flexibility is really important for some people. So this diagram on the right here just shows you generally how a part-time student might study over the year. Um, you start off by registering in September in, the, in your modules. You start your modules from October and you study through to the exam period in May and June with a series of tutorials throughout the year to keep you on track. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that in a minute. So what modules are on our distance learning MSc? Well, it's these ones right here. Um, so this shows first year options and final year, as I've called it. And so if you're intending to study full time, of course, you take all of these modules in your, in your only year of study. If you're flexible or part time, then you've got some options here. We generally recommend that you take these two modules first, ionizing radiation physics and medical imaging with ionizing radiation, because it contains sort of foundational information that you could find useful in future modules. And then your final year should definitely include the two research projects, the group research project, the medical device enterprise scenario, and your individual MSc project so that you can use the things you've learned in these, in these research projects. But in the middle here, you've got some different options. So quickly, just to go through what these modules include. Ionizing radiation physics, that's looking at the fundamental physics of how uh, X-rays mostly, but also charged particles, protons, etc., can be used in, in medical applications. And it looks at detectors and how do we detect and measure the amount of radiation given there. Medical imaging with ionizing radiation, that's looking at the main imaging methods using ionizing radiation. So X-ray imaging, CT, uh, nuclear medicine, such as uh, uh, PET scans and SPECT scanning as well. And then finally, a little bit about a radiation protection. How do we make sure that we keep patients safe as we're exposing them to this ionizing radiation? Then in the optional modules, you, know, you might have MRI and biomedical optics. So magnetic resonance imaging, biomedical optics is a massive research area that's happening in our department right now. UCL is certainly among the world leaders in that subject. And what's great about it is it's, uh, it's relatively cheap technology and it's an open field with lots of exploration happening right now. And it includes things like lasers, it includes things like functional scanning uh, of brains using optical methods, non-ionizing instead of x-rays. Really interesting module, that one. Clinical practice, that looks at anatomy and physiology for, uh, for our subject area. Not to the level, level of uh, needing that you'd need as a doctor, but certainly to a good level that you can apply it to all the imaging and radio and therapy modalities. Um, it also looks at electrical medical devices in some detail as well. Radiotherapy physics is looking at actually all different forms of cancer therapy uh, that we can we can do, and it follows on from the ionizing radiation physics. It looks at uh, X-ray treatments, it looks at brachytherapy slightly, and it looks at the proton therapy that uh, that you'll find more about as you come to UCL. Um, biomedical ultrasound looks at ultrasound, not just for imaging, but actually for new methods of treating cancer and other methods like that as well, another really exciting research area. And then computing in medicine is 
Another sort of key thing that any uh, medical physicist or biomedical engineer is going to need for a future career in our subject is actually looking at using computing methods applied to medical images in order to collect data from them automatically in some way. So a good example would be to take a CT of a patient and then you can automatically write a computer program that will be able to outline the organs that you might want or a tumor that you might want to highlight so that we can use, use that to target it with radiation, et cetera. Um, a, a really important tool that you'll be using over your entire career for sure. So it's, it's involving those computing methods. And then the final year, these two research projects, which I'll just talk a bit more about now, uh, or in a minute, actually, not after this slide. So quickly to describe to you, what's a typical year studying by distance learning like? Um, well, we start in September with an induction program um, where you'll meet your course mates, you'll meet your personal tutor, which in nearly all cases is myself. Um, and you choose your modules for that year based on our conversations and what you want to get out of the, out of the degree. Um, then you will hopefully learn the basics of distance learning. Some of you might have done some distance learning study over the last couple of years, particularly the pandemic has meant a lot of people have gone that way. But this is a slightly different course in that it's designed to be run by distance learning. It's not just adapted, like it might have been quite done quite last minute for, our, uh, for COVID mitigations. Um, so the idea of this induction is to give you an example just to go through so that you get used to all the tools that you'll need to study effectively by distance learning. And the idea is you learn by doing, it's not just information. We give you an exercise that requires you to study some lecture videos, take notes on that, to go to the UCL online library and uh, get access some research papers and books, extract some information from that that you'll need, collaborate with your peers, finding out ways to actually study effectively together whilst you're online, a really important thing. And then finally, solving problems yourself and then submitting your work online. So yeah, here's an example of the online library <laughs> shown. And there's a, there's a whole program to get you used to the course, if, particularly if you've not studied online before, but really to show you the, the kind of tools you should follow in order to effectively complete your studies with us. So week to week, um, study on your modules happens between October and March for our distance learning uh, course and each module is divided into subtopics based around the recorded lectures that we have here on campus. So you can see for example if you're doing ionizing radiation physics there's four weeks of lectures on photon interactions with Dennis which is myself and you can really break that down so that you know exactly what you need to study each week in order to keep up with the course. Um, so this is an example for part-time students, but if you were full-time, you would uh, double that. You go from about one or two hours of lecture videos a week up to about three to four per module. Um, to go with that is a very important part is to, to keep you studying actively. Um, and that's to do self-study problems, for, to have, have an active process in your learning, not just to read textbooks or just to watch lecture videos, which is not an effective way or really a fun way to study. Is actually find, get your hands in there and, uh, and solve some problems yourself. So these self-study problems are a key part for you to, to study on the course and you can get some feedback, hopefully with working with your peers. And also you get feedback from your personal tutor myself as you study. Um, and there's also all these extra resources we would expect. Um, so as I said at the bottom here, variable study is normal. So, you know, over a week, you might have days that you're busy and so you don't have time to study uh, and then you need to catch up later. That's completely normal for online study. I think you need to organize your own deadline. The purpose of the course is to give you the flexibility you need to fit it in around the rest of your life. So this process allows you by organizing by topics and then aiming at these tutorial structures that are set uh, once or twice a term, then that gives you a deadline to meet to. So here's an example of sharing forums that we ask our students when they complete a little ex self-study exercise, you upload it to a sharing forum, you can ask for feedback from me as the tutor, you can discuss problems with everyone else, see where you got stuck, etc. So here's a number of different ways that we do that. Um, the study, so that, that study schedule is based around these yellow parts here, the tutorials that we ask you, their exercises we ask you to complete as you study through the MSc. And there's three fixed tutorial review tasks for each module throughout the year. If you're studying part-time, then there'll be November, 
February and then March. Um, and then we can organize extra tutorials in April and May. But the idea of these is that they are usually informal, a way for you to review the lectures you've just done, test yourself and get some feedback from me as to whether you've done it all correctly. Um, sometimes they will count as coursework and they will count towards the final mark of the module, but generally they don't. It's just an informal way for you to test yourself and keep up. So here on the right is an example of one of those tutorial tasks, which was filtering in the frequency domain, and another one looking at more something fancy called morphological operations, which you'll learn about as you study on the course. So those tutorials have got different types of exercises. Uh, some of them are problem solving math style problems. Some of them will be literature reviews. Some of them will be data analysis from detectors or other imaging uh, methods. Some of them will be using research software or doing a bit of programming to, to, to automate some of the processes we can do. And then some of them will be exam paper, uh, exam paper practice for you. Um, they've got three main aims. First of all, just to, to give you a target to aim at as you study so that you can keep up with the course. Um, we also really want you to pass the course and do really well. So they're also helping you for your final assessments as a purpose. So, you know, sometimes giving you specific practice or giving you specific feedback where you're going wrong or to encourage you if you're doing going the wrong way, They'll encourage you if you're going the right way. And then finally, some of them are educational in terms of we're trying to get help you get some tools out of your study not we're not interested in you just learning the information that's part of our subject area learning the facts that's not really what what's going to be most useful to you from the msc we want you to be able to develop the skills that you can use to solve problems and in all kinds of different ways so some of them are based on that principle as well so generally you'll submit work um, on the deadlines it will be marked and then it's reviewed with the personal tutor via Teams or telephone, uh, and we go over the problems, we discuss them, if you can answer questions, and, uh, and we can clear up any misunderstandings. Um, as well as this, this is, these are the fixed tutorial times when, when I'm always available to speak to students based around these work, but you can actually ask for tutorials any time during the rest of the year as well, that's always available. I usually speak to my students quite a lot on a weekly basis by email, and some students more often, some students less often. It really depends on exactly what you need. But the point is that we are very proud of the support we give. So we, I'm very available for our distance learning students. Then in May and June, you'll generally do your end of year exams. Um, these exams are the exact same papers that you take that our on-campus students take. They're usually sat in a local exam centre to you. So we organise that in February or January of each year, uh, a place that's, that's convenient for you to sit and do your invigilated exams. Now, actually, in the last couple of years, things have changed slightly. Um, because of COVID, these exams have been converted now to online versions of the exams. So I'm not sure if that will continue going forward. It's likely it actually will. With that, this year, we're doing timed exams, but online. Um, so in that case, you won't need the local exam centre, you'll be able to take it from home on your computer. Many modules have also got coursework, which means that you know, components that are not the final exam that count towards your module mark. So it's usually about 20%. And in the modules that have it, they're integrated into those tutorial deadlines. So those three deadlines that I talked about for the tutorials, they might include a coursework element rather than an informal exercise. Um, research projects, again, only relevant for those of you studying in your final year, or if you're full time, of course, you'll do it in your first year as well. You study those research projects from October through to August, through past the exams and into the August term as well. Um, so that in, let's talk about the individual research project first. It's worth four taught modules, so it's weighting is much higher. So you need to make sure that you're devoting a decent amount of time for it. And there's generally two ways that our distance learning students take their research project. They can either develop a local project for themselves that we support with, uh, with our lecturers and professors here. Maybe you work in a hospital and there's a research piece of research that could be useful to your job. Maybe there's a local institution that would, would be uh, good for you to go into their labs and work in. That's possible and we support you doing that with an extra supervisor here at UCL. Um, also available is that you can just sign up for the list of master's project proposals that we give on campus here that are based on the research that our academics want to be done. It's worth saying as, an, as a master's student, you know, the, the, 
the expectation is that you will do an excellent piece of research and really contribute to that research group. They're looking for you to, to solve questions that they want answered. It's not uh, just a repetition or an exercise that's theoretical. We are looking for useful output from you. And so hopefully some students might end up publishing papers and staying for PhDs afterwards as well. If you impress during your MSc project, uh, you can get recruited for PhDs that happen. These on the right here show the different research groups in our department, again, on our website that Ilias mentioned. Uh, I would probably again encourage you, if you're interested, to look, to look at those and see what kind of research is, is happening in the department. Um, and then there's also the group project, which is a research project that you'll do in a group called the Medical Device Enterprise. So what is the Medical Device Enterprise? Well, you as distance learning students will take part in a group project with students here on campus. It's a mixed mode study project essentially and the idea is that you'll set a task at the start of the year and uh, you'll need to try and solve that task by inventing a brand new medical device and writing a business plan to take that medical device to an investor and then be able to start that company and set, start manufacturing and selling that device and it includes all the details that you would need in terms of technical specifications what materials do you need how much are they going to cost how is it going to be constructed uh, to the, the legal uh, ramifications in terms of what regulations you can need to follow to make sure you don't hurt patients, uh, what electrical parts, what, what, what mechanical parts are going to be relevant in there that you'll need to know about. And then finally, how are you going to market it? What is the target audience? How many people could buy this and what would be useful for? It's a really interesting applied project for you guys and it is led entirely by students it's not led by academics so so this is your unique opportunity in the msc to really test yourself and come up with something creative yourself it's often one of the favored modules on the msc really popular so you here you can see from this current year we are students that are on campus uh, having a lecture from Dr. Martin Fry, and on my laptop, you can just about see that we've got our distance learning students joining at the same time in those discussions. Um, so this is mixed mode. You will be in groups with uh, our campus students at the same time and have to adapt to that as well. To give you an example of a couple of the different types of tasks that are set to you at the start of the year, last year's one was looking at COVID support devices. This uh, uh, little image beneath, that shows a, an electrical stimulator that was used to, to help patients who are very weak in hospitals with COVID and might need some support in coughing. So that applies an electrical stimulator to the muscles of the abdomen in order to support a patient if they need to cough and they're too weak to do that. Really interesting project. And they went into full detail in terms of the safety of that and the effectiveness of that as well. Really interesting. Um, previous years, but here's another example, that the task was to find some technology for the visually or hearing impaired. So this is a braille reader that was invented to, site, to suit that. It looks like a little mouse, but it's got a little scanner underneath. Uh, the mouse, as, it, as you move that mouse over text, for example, a book, um, then it converts that to the braille output on these little pins you can see here on top of this mouse-like object. So it's a live converter and they made the thing. It was really, really great, really interesting. So this, this is a really interesting project for you as well that you'll take part in. Um, finally, if you want to know a little bit more about the research group specifically, or find if you're unaware of what's possible in medical physics or biomedical engineering, then you might consider listening to our department's uh, podcast, which I'm producer for, called Röntgen's Radio, named after the discoverer of x-rays. Um, have a look. It's on all the podcast apps, basically, and it's really interesting. There, it's a discussion show with a researcher about their research, and it's, it's at a level that anyone can understand. So you can share it with family members. It's certainly applicable for any of you guys who might be interested in the course. If you want to learn about MRI, the latest techniques, if you want to learn about electron microscopy and what you can do, it in med do with it in medical physics, then, uh, then have a look at that podcast. I really recommend it. Um, another thing to say is that you'll be a department member. As a distance learning student, you're not in the room, but you're very much part of our community. And we hope that you'll take advantage of the resources that UCL gives you as a distance learning student with us. Um, you're not isolated. You may email, speak to your lecturers on Teams in person. You can join our, lunch, our lunchtime research seminars that are on a monthly basis. Yeah. You can make use of our careers resources and support team, which we're gonna to talk to Russo in a moment about that. Um, you can come and visit London, that's, that's good as well. Distance learning students, no requirement ever to come to London. 
in terms of your study, but if you would like to, you can do that. You can come and use our study resources on campus. You can speak to our lecturers. You can uh, get some work experience if you need it. Um, and we want you to collaborate as part of your research project with the groups and hopefully our research projects allow you to do that. So I'd really encourage you to make use of the opportunities that UCL gives you. So careers after graduation, where do people go? Perhaps uh, I'm just going to pass over to uh, a member of our excellent UCL career service um, who are really available. They're available for you as you study on the course and afterwards, and they're, they're, they're an excellent resource. So I'm just going to pass over to Arusa, who's going to talk about exactly what the career service do. Hi, so I'm Arusa. I'm the internships and vacancies officer, part of UCL careers um, and part of the engineering careers team. So we specifically support engineering students during their time at UCL, as well as up to three years after they graduate with career guidance. Um, some of the things that we support students and graduates with include um, checking applications and CVs, helping prepare for interviews, coming up with a tangible action plan as to kind of the next steps that they could go on to do, as well as signposting to resources that are related to areas of interest. Um, in addition to that, we also work quite closely with employers when it comes to recruitment. So we support employers with advertising um, graduate and internship vacancies through our jobs board, um, especially ones targeted specifically at engineering students. And we also have employers that um, attend events. Um, and I should mention as well, the careers appointments are both virtual as well as in person. So you do have the option um, to have those appointments virtually. And then the career events that we host, um, which we work quite closely with employers with a wide range of different employers. Those are also um, currently virtual and we're looking at having those both virtual and in person moving forward. To give you a bit of information about what graduates in this area go on to do um, in terms of the job roles. So some of the roles include medical physicist, management consultant, structured products, marketing sales officer, trainee clinical scientist, clinical researcher, associate recruitment consultant, associate physicist, um, radiotherapy um, physicist, electrical and biomedical engineering, clinical engineer. So these are just some of the roles um, that our graduates have gone on to do once they've completed the course. And to share a bit of information about some of the employers that they've gone on to work with, these include KPMG, Hayes, um, PhD Medial Imaging, Rem Remedica Image, I hope I'm saying that right, um, the Northwest London Hospitals, NHS Trust, the Lister Hospital, Cambridge University Hospitals, Plymouth Hospitals. Um, so those are just um, a few employers that our graduates have gone on to work with once they've completed their time at UCL. Um, so yeah, just to kind of summarize in terms of the support we can provide. So we can support with applications, you can have one-to-one -one guidance, and this includes um, looking at your applications, as well as mock interviews. We have regular events that we run with employers. These are panel events, and you have a chance to network with them. And as I mentioned before, these are both virtual and in person. We can also signpost you to relevant um, careers resources, support you with exploring a particular area, or provide you with more information where relevant. And we also have vacancies as well, which employers post on our jobs board, and we support them in connecting with you. If there's any questions, please do put it in the chat box or the Q&A box, um, and I'll try and provide more information um, if there's anything careers related. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, well, we'll save those questions until the end, perhaps. Um, I'll just quickly go through a couple of more bits of business. Um, the entry requirements for the course, we generally require a 2-1 UK bachelor's degree or overseas equivalent. Um, in physics, engineering, computer science, mathematics, or other closely related discipline. Um, um, additionally to that, if the applicant has a 2-2 degree, we also do accept uh, those degrees as well, but they might be invited for a short online chat to talk about the suitability of the course 
uh, with us. We mostly are interested in checking that, that this is the right course for you. Um, it is competitive, so we do encourage you to apply, but uh, uh, yeah, those are, those are the minimum requirements for the course. Financially as well, you can see here on the screen the, the course fees for next academic year for UK and overseas students. And you should be aware that there's a couple of schemes that you might look into uh, for financing your study through either the UK government postgraduate student loans. On, there's also a series of scholarships that the UCL runs centrally. There's not, a cent there's not a department one specifically, but you might find that you can apply for those scholarships. You'll need to see if you're eligible by looking through the UCL scholarships web pages first though. And that's the end of my presentation for today. So um, I'll just, I think I've stopped sharing screen. Um, we're gonna go and talk now very quickly to one of our current students who is uh, Seema. She's a first year uh, distance learning student at the moment studying flexibly. Seema, hi, would you mind turning your camera on and saying hello to everyone? Hi everyone. <laughs> hi, great, thanks for coming. Um, Perhaps you could start, could you just tell us a little bit about um, why you decided to study by distance learning with us? Yeah, yeah um, basically I did a, a master's in engineering 10 years ago. Uh, so I wanted to get back into, a, you know, a similar field. But um, I'm currently living in Dubai. So there's not many opportunities here for further education. Mm -hmm. And this just seemed perfect. Yeah, great. Excellent. Um, and how are you finding studying so far? You've been with us since September last year. How, how, how are you finding it generally? You've, you're, uh, how I'm many, really enjoying it. Hmm. How many yeah. modules are you taking this year? Just so everyone knows. <laughs> three modules this year. So I'm going to try to do it um, on the three year track. Hmm. Yeah, great. And do you have any, do you have any advice for studying effectively by distance learning? <laughs> Uh, it, what's good and what's the what, what's effective for your studying so far i know you're doing well uh, but perhaps you could describe <laughs> uh, it's to be honest it's very easy to navigate the, the online system is really good um it's flexible uh, I, I don't currently work but um i'm a stay-at-home mom so it's very flexible for me which is good um yeah yeah okay great oh that's good um, yeah, how about, uh, how, how, how do you find the lecturers generally? Because it's interesting. Uh. Yeah, there's a really a broad range of uh, uh, lecturing styles. Um, but yeah, I'm happy with all of them. Uh, Which ones have you been studying so far? You don't need to uh, name the lecturers, but topics perhaps. Oh, topics. Uh, uh, ionizing radiation, that's one of my uh, modules. Uh, imaging and uh, MRI, hmm. uh, yes. at the moment I'm doing uh, biomedical optics. Yeah, so what, do you know what your future plans are after the MSc, what are you hoping to do afterwards? Out of interest. Um, I, I was hoping you wouldn't ask me that. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that's okay, we don't need to answer, that's fine, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Probably should have given you warning beforehand, but yeah, so there's, you know, there's a lot of different options. Perhaps if you've got any questions for Seema, you'd like to know, um, then, then you can ask ask it in the chat as well, and we and we can ask her and see what she says. So, um, yeah, I, I've not put, I've not held anything over Seema. She's be very honest, and I encourage her to be honest if there's problems or anything else. But we generally hope that we support our students well. And um, and uh, if you want to ask about specifics, then you can do that and study it as well. So, thank you, Seema. Perhaps we're, unless there's anything else you'd like to say about the course. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, it's been very supportive, like um, you're always available, uh, very quick to reply, so the support's really good. Hmm. Okay, great, excellent, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm going to go to the questions now, and if you've got any more questions, feel free to type them in the, in the chat or the question and answer box as well. Um, I'm just going to go through and answer some of these. So the first one, we've got here is uh, actually about one of the other MSc programs in the department. It was, has any medical student holding a bachelor's degree in medicine and surgery ever been admitted to the MSc in medical robotics and AI course? And what should a final year medical student do to build a portfolio for securing admission to that program? So yeah, that's one of our, that's one of our programs that's a sort of sister program to the physics and engineering and medicine. 
Um, there's options to take some of the same modules as well. Um, I would say that program is really aimed, you would need to have a significant background in uh, programming um, and some form of computer science uh, to be admitted to that program. So it's not impossible for a student to have a medical background for sure, but you'd need to have significant academic experience with, with uh, programming skills because that's that's the major part of the course. It does not start from scratch. If you've never done any programming before, then that's not really a, pro a program that would be appropriate for you. Um, the MSc in Physics and Engineering and Medicine, the Computing and Medicine course actually does start from a principle that you've never done any program before. So that might be a good way of, of, of leaning into that. But that particular program on medical robotics and AI assumes a certain level of experience already, actually. So it, it would depend. You could probably email the, the, the course runner, who's Matt Clarkson. Again, if you look on the Graduate Prospectus website, you'll find details on how to contact him if you want to ask that. But yeah, you want you want computing skills, really. Great. Um, any other questions? We've had another one in the chat from a while ago. So if you do not have any background in biology, um, you, are you able to handle this program? Yes, absolutely. It is, it's a program aimed at physicists and engineers generally. So we don't expect that you would have any background in biology. There's no requirements on that at all. Nearly all the modules do have uh, do you start from a principle that you can do some problem solving and you've got some physics and engineering background in some way, but they also teach you from the fundamentals. Um, on the biology side, uh, there's one course that teaches anatomy and physiology for medical physics and biomedical engineering, and that starts from scratch. So no, no biology requirements at all. Um, is the mathematical representations in robotic control theory and systems module, mainly Z and Laplace domains, um, I'm afraid I'm not sure I can answer that. That module, that particular module, is a relatively new one. Um, so, we, if you send an email, I would recommend to uh, the department question box. Again, if you look on our department on the on the course prospectus for the, the department, then you should find a contact details, which is Medfis Teaching uh, at UCL.ac.uk. Um, if you send an email to there, you'll get an emailed answer to that. That's not a module I'm. I'm thoroughly familiar with, so I think you probably need to ask that one uh, personally. Yeah, so Naomi's uh, kindly put uh, uh, Matt Clarkson, Dr. Matt Clarkson's uh, details in in the chat. Uh, yeah, okay, and she's also put in that question that uh, contact detail in as well. Great, um, great. Another question. Um, in terms of entry requirements, I have a background of radiography with experience in both X-rays and MRI. Would I meet the entry requirements? So yes, potentially we do accept uh, uh, students in radiography degrees, um, particularly if they've got uh, some extra work experience related, like it sounds like you do. The main concern we have is that you have the required mathematical ability to solve the problems that, that come up in the course. So usually there's some, we'd expect some description of what, that you do have that mathematical ability in some way, but that's that's another common way. We have lots of students with radiography degrees that, that come in as well. And in theory, you develop the skills that you need as you study it anyway. So you don't necessarily need a full physics degree, um, So, but uh, it, it will also depend on the grade you've got. You still need to meet the entry requirements in terms of a 2221, basically 22 minimum, but a 21 would, would be automatically fine. Uh, other questions in the chat. There is another one. So when do I expect to get a reply? I submitted my application in early January 2022. So yeah, the, the, the process of approving uh, the applications usually takes between one and two months. Um, it depends on the busyness at the time of the year. Right now is quite a busy time of year. So I'm sorry if you haven't had a reply yet, a decision on your application um i'm sure it will be coming very very soon um yeah it, it, there there are a lot of applications coming this partly through our graduate admissions office at ucl and partly through the tutors the admissions tutor who decides whether you should be made an offer as well but that that will hopefully be coming soon but sometimes it does take a little longer so uh yeah please do be patient it, it which program were you applying for do you are you applying for the MSc Physics and Engineering Medicine or one of the other ones? Feel free to answer there. I'll move on to another question in the meantime. Um, 
So is there any AI research towards spiking neural networks? Um, again, probably a question for our computing specialists in the department. I'm, I'm a medical physicist myself. So uh, again, I'm not particularly familiar exactly what, whether, whether that content is covered, but I will say that the modules that are coming, that are, that are available in our department, are very much on the leading edge of new techniques. They're being taught by people making the science, making the new computer science as they do it. So, but again, that might be a good question to email to Matt Clarkson, for example, who is yeah, running the MRI, the, the, the medical robotics and AI route. There's actually also a possibility in future, though this is probably a couple of years away, um, for an MSc program coming in medical imaging and AI. So there's actually a lot of expertise in our department in artificial intelligence, uh, methods that apply to medical imaging, etc. But I think you'll probably need to email specifically about that. Didn't see in the list of publications. So yeah, it, it does, it, you'll need to ask. I'm afraid I'm not particularly familiar exactly with that, but if you do ask the correct people, I'm sure you'll get an accurate answer. So not sure, sorry now. Any other questions? Yeah, MSc physics, okay. So yeah, the physics and engineering medicine, yeah, that there should be replies within one or two months, basically. It, it, as I say, it's quite a busy time of year right now. Well, one other thing to say perhaps is that the application deadline for the, for the course, you'll find on, on our graduate prospectus, the application deadline is the end of March uh, this year. There's a possibility if there are still places available on the course, that's, that deadline will be extended. But if you have an intention to study with us from September this year, you need to, I recommend you apply as early as possible and don't necessarily rely on that, on that being open a bit longer. I know that there are some people working in NHS hospital departments who need a little bit longer for funding um, to see whether they get their funding for their course, uh, for their studies before, before that might not come through until after March. I would probably recommend that it might be worth applying anyway in that case. If you want to start in September, you don't have to attend necessarily. You can actually defer your decision if that's something that doesn't come through. I'd probably recommend that you apply um, before the deadline to ensure that, that you do get that place. There's no guarantee right now whether, the, the, whether it will be extended. Um, those decisions are actually made by UCL centrally and there are so many applicants to UCL's courses that uh, that they may decide to close the lot if, if UCL is full, as it were. But um, anyway. Will the related careers be more about facing machine or facing people? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, both is certainly the answer. There's, uh, we're a department of physicists, engineers, and computer scientists generally. So there are people that work heavily with the clinics and they do patient studies and there are people who work exclusively with software and machinery so it's up to you basically you get to decide there's certainly reach areas in both so you know it's an expanding subject uh it certainly could be either you you would specialize yourself essentially and hopefully there's opportunities in both we find that they go well together like a bit of both taking new techniques to the clinic is an important thing that we all do um, so far, how many people have applied for the MSc non-distance learning program? programme? Um, I don't have the data for you right now, but I think it's towards about 100. Um, so it does, generally each year, we, I, I, I showed you that slide at the start of, uh, about our student numbers. We end up with about 60 MSc students across the department. It kind of depends. Um, uh, you know, if you are offered a place on the course, then then you then you can come. Like you don't need to worry about numbers once you've had your your offer, basically. So, in terms of studying with other students, um, you know, the course is you, there's lots of collaborative work between students. If you're worried about that, um, distance learning, the numbers are generally slightly a, a part of that. We generally have between 25 and 20, 25 students uh, a year on distance learning program. Um, so that gives you an idea of numbers there, at least. Okay, I'm worried about the mathematics aspects within the MSc. What level of support is provided so I can get better at this? So, yeah, there is, there's, there's, a, there's a decent amount of support. The, intro, the, the starter course, when the induction for the distance learning MSc, for example, includes 
a, what's called a maths primer that basically gives you an idea of the kind of things we, we expect you to be able to do and gives you a bit of help to, to solving that as well. Now, every module starts from a, like a fairly basic principle. And so skills are developed as you study those modules going through. But ultimately, most of the support comes through how much you want to contact either your personal tutor, me, or the lecturers in case as well. So there's lots of problems and we recommend that students go through problems to, to help their understanding. And if you're worried about the mathematics, you should probably spend some more time on that and ask for more help. Um, you know, we're very giving with our time towards our students. So it's up to you to choose how much help you get. What is the tuition fee? Per year for part time study? So that's a good question. Um, that's something that I, uh, if you if you send an email to the part, to me, then I'll I'll give you the specifics. Basically, there's a document breakdown, but basically each module, um, the fees for one module is divided based on the number of uh, the, the fees for that year. Um, each module is worth one twelfth of the total fees for the course. So if you're if you're part time and taking three modules, look at the full time fees and then take three twelfths of that module. The exception of course is the MSc research project, which is worth four modules, as I said. So that's worth a quarter, a third, sorry, of the total fees. So that they're, they're portioned based on the weighting of each module in the course. And so each taught module is a twelfth. So the fees for, uh, for three modules in your first year, for example, would be three twelfths. Does that make sense? So hopefully that breaks down clearly. But if you want the specifics on that, then do email me and, I, uh, and I'll send you my explainer document that I give to all our students to, to explain that. And it also tells you when you can pay your fees because you, you don't have to pay your fees at the start of the year, you can pay in installments throughout the year and there's extra information on that as well. Uh, Billy, I've just popped the uh, part-time fees from the prospectus into the chat box as well for anybody. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the, the most accurate yeah, right. I'm not sure that's actually, yeah. It's what it, it, it does. Now. Yeah, it does depend. So uh, yeah, with the part-time, because it's two years, I'm not sure that's actually accurate because uh, if you study part-time, the most normal way to study is you take four taught modules in your first year, and then second year you take four taught modules and your research MSc project. So actually you end up paying more fees in second year than in the first year, the, the weighting is slightly different, one third and two thirds. Um, but yeah, it's weighted by the total number of credits you take that year, basically, that's how that's how it does break down. I think those those part-time fees are actually from last year, actually, Naomi, because um, looking at the overseas total, it looks, it looks too low. Or maybe, I think the part-time fees might just be half because, because the part-time MSc is two years, the full-time MSc is one year, so that might just be averaging on half. But uh, yeah, my email, if you want to contact me is, so uh, yeah, I am Billy Dennis, but my name, my full, my legal name is William. Um, so my email is w.dennis at ucl.ac.uk. But again, if you email medfist.teaching, the, the one that Naomi has already put in the chat, then, then it will get to me as well. It gets forwarded by our, our administration team to me. So if you'd like to email me specifically, then do. Um, great. Any more questions I haven't answered yet? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure I've got any more questions here right now. But if you do have any, then please do email me. I'm happy to answer as well. Um, again, that application deadline is the end of March. Um, so I encourage you to, to get your applications in if you if you can. And uh, thanks uh, for coming, everyone. And thank you to Naomi for organizing this and to Rusa and to Seema for coming up to talk to us very briefly as well. Um, other than that, goodbye. Nice to nice to nice to meet some of you. <laughs>